AI is a powerful tool. summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values. Welcome to AI for Good the leading, action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Hello, friends of AI, Earth and Sustainability. Um, my name is Gustav Kamps. I would like to welcome everyone at our third talk in this seminar series on AI for Earth and Sustainability Science. This seminar series in the program AI for Good of the ITU is co-convened by myself, by Michael Reichstein, Joachim Densla, and Maria Piles, and was initiated in the context of the Excellence Network Alice for the development of AI in Europe. Uh, first of all, thanks for attending this meeting, uh, all of you. Um, today, we'll, we will continue with more AI for ideology after the previous talk two weeks ago by Frederick Kratza on LSTMs for rainfall runoff modeling. It is my absolute pleasure to present our speaker today, Gray Nering, a research scientist at Google, uh, who will talk about uh, AI for flood monitoring and flood forecasting. Gray holds a PhD in hydrology from the University of Arizona and has worked for many different uh, organizations uh, like NASA, NCAR, and, and NOAA. And before joining Google, uh, he was a professor at the University of Alabama, the University of California, Davis, too. Uh, Dr. Neary has developed implementations of, of machine learning for flood forecasting models that are, are now widely used. So we are super excited about your talk today, uh, Gray. Uh, so yeah, look, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gustav. Thank you so much. So just to be clear, uh, can everyone There we go. Can everyone see my screen? I'm going to assume that's a yes. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for having me and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the flood forecasting work that we're doing. Um, I'll take you sort of through a brief history of uh, Google's, flood, uh, Google's flood forecasting initiative. And our goal really is to provide a, a short-term flood forecast, actionable flood forecast to as much of the world as possible. All right, thank you. Okay, so just to get started, we'll have a little publicity video. I'm gonna to have to turn off a couple times in this presentation, I'm gonna to have to turn, uh, switch things up so that uh, between my microphone and the tab audio. So give me just one second.
Every year, millions of people worldwide are impacted by floods, leaving behind thousands of fatalities and billions in economic damage. Early warning systems have been proven to assist governments and NGOs as they strive to minimize damages and loss of life. To contribute to this effort, Google Research has developed AI models to forecast when and where riverine floods will occur around the world. Introducing the Google Flood Hub. The Flood Hub shows how river water will change over time. The predicted flood water depth and detailed flood maps. All information is free and publicly available to help people worldwide access vital flood information when time is of the essence. Okay, so get, now that we're through the promotional video, uh, just to give a little background on what we're talking about, uh, Google's involved in the AI for social good effort um, at, at a few in a few different ways. One of the uh, larger projects that Google's invested in in this space is flood forecasting. And the reason that Google initially uh, decided to choose flood forecasting as uh, one of the AI for good uh, initiatives here in Google Research is because floods impact uh, more people than any other type of natural disaster in the world. And there's um, there's substantial evidence, uh, uh, peer-reviewed evidence that early warnings, flood early warnings can save uh, people's lives and, and, and save quite a bit of economic damage. Um, so the world uh, lacks really high quality uh, flood forecasts and we're trying to sort of fill that hole to the best of our ability. So our flood forecasting system basically looks like this. We have a hydrologic model that turns uh, a rainfall forecasts or weather forecasts into stream flow forecasts. We feed that into an inundation model that gives an area of uh, land that's going to be covered by water. And then we use that information to distribute warnings. And we distribute warnings through a variety of methods. One is through Google search. So if you search for floods in your area. If you're in an area where we do uh, operational forecasting, you'll see our flood forecasts uh, and it'll be some sort of um, either an alert up at the top or some sort of uh, chart that shows how deep the water is gonna be in your area. Uh, Google Maps will show fl uh, flood forecasts and flood alerts mm -hmm. in a spatial sense, um, in, again, in the places where we forecast floods. And I'll talk a little bit about where that is and isn't in a little bit. And the third way that we disseminate uh, flood warnings is through smartphone notifications to Android and iOS devices. And so if you're, if you're in a country where we've, uh, we've been given permission by the government to issue uh, no, uh, push notifications and you're in an area that we forecast will be flooded, then you might receive a notification telling you that uh, this is going to happen. Okay, so we work uh, closely with NGOs around the world. We have some training uh, efforts to sort of help uh, help uh, the uh, disseminate the types of the various types of tools that we have for for uh, showing this information and train NGOs on how to use the information that we're giving them, how to interpret the information that we produce about uh, flood forecasts and how to use that. And then they can go on and use that in ways that they know uh, best in terms of how to interact with communities. So the main uh, tool that we have for, for uh, disseminating information to sort of sophisticated users that are actively looking for this information and aren't arriving at it passively is the Google Flood Hub. The Google Flood Hub looks like this. And again, excuse me while I switch my Hi, Gray. Sorry, we can't actually hear you on mute. Thank you. Okay, so this is the Google Flood Hub, and this is all of the places with little polygons are places where we're doing active forecasting. Just to be clear, you can hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Okay, and so what you can do is you can kind of zoom in in one of these places. We'll see there's a, 
a small event happening in uh, down here in the DRC. And we can zoom in on this pin and we can look at the little card that's associated with this pin on this river. And we can see that in this particular, uh, uh, this particular river, we expect an increase in stream flow over the next uh, six hours or so. And it should increase past what we consider to be a warning level. We define warning levels and danger levels based on return period events in different locations. And so these are the places in the world where we're issuing alerts and, and issuing forecasts. And it's, as you can see, it's not the entire world. We choose places to launch based on uh, two primary criteria. One is where our models validate well enough that we're confident in releasing forecasts. And the other is where we have permission or our legal authority to issue forecasts. So there are certain places where, you know, the right to issue uh, environmental type warnings or weather related warnings are controlled by government agencies like in the United States and we we make sure not to do uh, work in those areas so these this is where we cover right now the model that we run by the way which we'll talk about in some depth presently actually runs over the whole world and then we just display it to the public where we're allowed and confident in displaying um, information okay Great, sorry, you're on mute again. Thank you for telling me, keep telling me. Um, so we do like to partner with NGOs because NGOs are have uh, more experience than we do interacting directly with communities. And this is one of the most effective ways that we found to sort of communicate warnings to people directly. And so this is an example of a use case that is just concluding uh, as we speak. This is an end-to-end -end use case with an organization called Give Directly a pilot study that we did with them over the last few weeks where they engage about 6,000 individuals in several villages in Mozambique and they send uh, cash, uh, cash to these individuals by SMS either before or after a flood and they, they use our flood forecast to determine whether they're going to send uh, cash before a flood. So this, this, is, this particular uh, interaction is a randomized control trial where they sent cash to certain villages before a flood, certain villages after a flood, and then some villages did not get, uh, did not get the cash disbursement. And again, they, the before flood cash disbursements were based on the uh, Google model. And yes, okay. And so when we interact with an NGO, um, this we basically give tools like this that I'm about to show you uh, that uh, sort of is describe how to use the products that we're developing. So I'll give you sort of a taste. We have several YouTube videos like this, and I'll show you one just to give a kind of example. People like me who live by the river experience floods every year with Google Flood Hub you can find out how much flooding will take place in our location in the next few days and how the water levels at the river may change. Let's see how you can do this. The Flood Hub provides you with advanced information on floods globally. To learn about the flood situation in your area, go to g.co slash flood hub in the map, you can see your village and where the flood water is expected to reach. You will be able to see the change in the river water levels and how high the water will reach at your location. By swiping up the screen, you can also see how the water level in the river closest to your location is rising or falling over the course of one week. The orange line shows the level at which the water is considered to be at a warning level and the red line shows when the water has reached a danger level. You can share this information with your friends and family by tapping on the share icon. And to subscribe to this information, you can tap on the bell icon, which will keep you informed about any changes. Remember, at times of floods, go to g.co slash flood hub to be informed on floods around you. Great. Okay, so 
that's basically what we're doing and why and sort of the motivation and, and the end result that we're looking for. Our, the Flood Hub, by the way, went live in November of 2022. So it's a fairly it's a fairly new service that Google offers. Prior to 2022, we were uh, we were doing the uh, flood alerts only for India and Bangladesh and a couple of other countries. And we used a slightly different model to do that. So now I want to talk a little bit about the model that we use and the AI that we use and kind of how we got to the point where we're using AI for flood forecasting. Um, this is our legacy system from 2021. This was a system we had operational in partnership with the uh, CWC, the, the water agency in India. And we, at the time in 2021, we covered about 376 river gauges over several hundred thousand square kilometers. We covered a few hundred million people. And over a period of a, of a couple of years, we issued uh, somewhere on the order of magnitude 100 million location-based notifications to cell phones. Again, those are the push notifications that go to Android and iOS devices. The challenge with this model is that we were relying on data from uh, partner government partners. So we would get uh, stream flow data to feed into our models every uh, every day. And the models had to be trained per location. So we would use uh, stream flow data at a particular location and upstream from that location. And we would train a very simple model to predict future uh, stream flow over the next few hours at every single gauge. So the, the, there are two strong limitations. One is these can't extrapolate. You can see that although a lot of people are covered by the areas that, that are shown on this map, it definitely doesn't cover even the whole uh, country of India. And we rely on data streams that are um, sometimes difficult to get and certainly difficult to get at a global scale. So uh, what we'd like to do is we'd like to make predictions that cover as much of the world as possible. And the major challenge in doing that is this sort of scientific challenge called prediction in ungaged basins. And prediction in ungaged basins is a named problem in the field of hydrology. It was the decadal problem of the International Association of Hydrological Sciences from 2003 to 2013. And basically what this means is that we wanna be able to make stream flow predictions in watersheds that don't have data records, that don't have uh, recording uh, gauge measurements, that, that don't have data. And this is, a, this is a serious problem. So here's a set of uh, results from a recent 2022 benchmarking study that happened in the United States and Canada, where a bunch of hydrological modeling groups took their models and uh, made predictions at a whole bunch of different watersheds and both in sample and out of sample. So both places where there were stream flow gauges, these are places with a lot of data to train the models and places without stream flow data. So this big block on the left are sort of skill scores where blue means higher skill, the model has higher skill, red means the model has lower skill. So these are locations where there was training data. And over here on this small block on the right are locations where there's no training data. And then the rows on this plot are different hydrological models. These are different models that different hydrology groups around the world contributed to the study. And you can see that in general, in places where we, there is stream flow gauge data to train a model, you get much higher scores than places where there is no stream flow data to train a model. There's much more red on the right-hand plot than on the left-hand plot. And this is a big problem because about 1% of the world's watersheds have stream flow gauges. There's approximately 1 million watersheds, according to the HydroSheds, uh, one of the main hydrography databases in the world. There's approximately 1 million watersheds in the world. And there are something order of magnitude 10,000 stream flow gauges in the world that are, have publicly available clean data. There are something on the order of 30,000 stream flow gauges in the world that are publicly available, but a lot of those have um, uh, have very messy data. And so when it comes to training an AI model to, produce, to predict uh, uh, stream flow and flood events, we have about 10,000 gauges to work with. And there's a strong correlation between the, the stream flow data record in a country and the GDP of, of a country. So this x-axis here is supposed to say 2020 GDP, it got cut off. But basically you see there's a strong correlation between the, uh, the economy, the size of the economy in a country and the total years of stream flow data record in a country. And this is a serious problem because uh, countries with uh, lower GDPs tend to be more have be more vulnerable to floods. The, the human impacts of flooding tend to be higher and the, the, the human risks, both economic and uh, livelihood and lives risks of flooding tend to be higher in places, uh, countries with uh, uh, lower GDP. And so this is a problem sort of a, this is sort of a global problem where 
if you want to predict in places without lots of data, then or you want to predict in places where people are most vulnerable to floods, you're also trying to predict in places without lots of data to train your models. So this is where machine learning can help. So this is sort of a timeline of some of these seminal papers in this problem of prediction in ungauged basins. The International Association of Hydrological Sciences launched a decade of uh, study on this problem in 2003. That decade ended in 2013. There was a lot of progress in, during that decade sort of bringing the hydrological sciences community together to solve problems, but there was not a lot of progress in terms of actually making better predictions in locations where we need them the most. And in 2019, uh, a research group that I was involved with published a paper that showed that machine learning can uh, produce stream flow models that are better at extrapolating than classical hydrology models. So in, in this study, in a small set of catchments in the United States, we had 531 watersheds in the United States. We trained some machine learning models to predict out of sample. So we used a cross-validation study and predicted in watersheds where we didn't have training data. And we got better predictions in un effectively ungaged watersheds or watersheds that didn't contribute training data to our, our to training our AI model. We got better predictions than the two operational uh, flood forecasting models in the United States, or at least the models that are used to produce operational flood forecasts in the United States. The, the, uh, this is a CDF plot where we have an R square scored on, on the, on the x-axis. That's sort of a skill score on the x-axis. You want to be as high as possible. And then a fraction, this cumulative density on the y-axis means a fraction of the 531 basins that got a certain skill score. So lines that are further to the right mean better skill in more places. And we have uh, three models on this, on this plot. One is the dark blue line, which is the United States National Water Model, which is run out of the NOAA National Water Center, which is on the campus of uh, the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. And the uh, red dotted line is the Sacramento Soil Moisture Model, which is the model that's used by the NOAA River Forecast Centers in the United States. And this particular version of the Sacramento model was calibrated by the U.S. National Center for Atmospheric Research. And they, do they donated that model to us, uh, the results from that model for this study. And then we used an LSTM-based model uh, trained both in sample and out of sample, those are the, the gold lines, out of sample being the gold line with stars. And we're in general, we're getting better skill predictions, even when we're even in ungauged basins than sort of the two main models used in the for you in the United States for flood forecasting when those models are calibrated to a specific location. So this represents a pretty large step change in the ability to, uh, to forecast stream flow. And our goal is really we want to take this, the, this, this sort of uh, discovery, and we want to turn it into something that's globally useful. So in order to do that, we had to do two things. We had to extend the model so that it does forecasts. And this is a, this sort of a diagram of the model we're using. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it's basically for those uh, sort of technically interested, it's an encoder decoder type model structure, basically a decoder uh, sequence model. And here we're using an LSTM for a time sequence model. A decoder model runs up to the date of present, up to today, and then a, an encoder model, and then a decoder model takes over from today and goes out seven days in the future. So we predict seven days of, of stream flow flood. We, we give at least seven days, or at most seven days warnings. And so we use a different model to predict out into the future than we do into the past. And the reason for that is that the drivers, the, the data that drives our models are atmospheric predictions. So we get data from weather forecasts to drive our models. And weather forecasts change significantly depending on whether those forecasts are data that, uh, from the past so that they are the, the weather has already happened versus data that, uh, from the future. So these are actual weather forecasts produced by the model. So there's a, a sharp change in accuracy of weather forecasts between the past and the future. And to recognize that, we use a model structure that sort of breaks the past and the future mm -hmm. into separate components. And so that's how we approach the forecasting problem. And the other thing we needed to do to sort of make this these ML innovations uh, uh, meaningful is we needed to train global models. So we needed to take all of the stream flow data that we could get from around the world and train one model on all of this, on all of this data. And so this is just a map of where uh, we took training data. So we got training data from two major sources. One is from the Global Runoff uh, Data Center in, in the European Union, and that contributed about, about 5,000 gauges worth of data. 
and we got about about the same amount, five or six thousand gauges worth of data from the Caravan project. The Caravan project is an open source uh, data project that was initiated at Google to try to collect and standardize streamflow data around the world. So. Uh, there was a recent uh, Nature Scientific data publication about this, and it, it basically we have a set of uh, software that you can get on GitHub, and if you have Streamflow data in your country or even in your just local area, and you, you're allowed to make that data public, then you can go and you can clip the corresponding weather data and the corresponding geophysical data necessary to run a hydrology model. You can clip that out for the watershed where you have Streamflow data, and you can add your data to this global sort of open source uh, Streamflow database. Anyone can use the data. Anyone can use the software. It's available on GitHub. And so we got half of our data from that and half of our data from this uh, European Union initiative. And we trained the model. And here's just the results of uh, some cross-validation experiments. We split the gauges that we have up in three different ways. Uh, one by just splitting randomly. So we had 10 groups of random gauges around the world and one by climate zones. So we split all of the um, all, all of the major climate zones in the world and we trained on all except for one and then predicted on all the basins in that last climate zone. And we repeated that to get out of sample predictions for all watersheds in the world. And then the other was by continent. We split up all of our watersheds by continent and trained on all continents except one and then predicted in one continent. And you can kind of see how the skill of the model sort of decreases as you get further and further away from your training data set. These are the same uh, cumulative density function plots we saw before, where we have a skill score on the x-axis and a fraction of the total basins out of, again, about 11,000 basins we're using here to train this model, a fraction of the total basins on the y-axis. And the red line is what happens when you, we predict, uh, we use a model that's trained on all the basins and then we predict on all the basins using a split sample in time so we don't predict the same data we train on but we use this data from the same watershed just different periods of time the blue line is when we split the, the watersheds up randomly and we train on 90 percent and test on 10 percent but they're they're split randomly and then the green is where we split along climate zones and the orange is where we split along continents so we hold out an entire continent worth of data and then predict on that continent and we repeat that until all the continents are, um, are, are predicted out of sample. And you can see there is a degradation in the skill as you, as you have these more strict uh, uh, out of sample splits. And as a point of reference, the, the ECMWF, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting model, uh, flood model called GLOFAST, the Global Flood Awareness System, the, the skill of that model is plotted here in purple and that model is calibrated. So that model has seen data from every uh, watershed where it's used to make predictions. And you can see again that, that at least uh, some of our out of sample predictions, uh, some of the ways that we split our data to test this, basically if we, don't, if we do something less drastic than holding out an entire continent's worth of data, that our out of sample predictions, our ungauged predictions are more skillful according to this, this uh, this R, this R squared metric in a C stands for the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency, which is a fancy way for hydrologists to say R squared standard correlation metric. So if you, um, so you can see that our ungauged predictions at a global scale are on average more accurate than the current state of the art. Um, so this doesn't really help us. These R squared metrics on predicting time series of stream flow don't really tell us much about how accurate we are at predicting floods. So we came up with a metric to measure the accuracy for predicting extreme events. Basically, what we did is we took, uh, we measured sort of the magnitude of flow in a river that would constitute a particular return period event. So like a two year flow would mean the maximum flow that you would expect to see on average every two years. And we, so we measured the, um, the, we, we calculated using the entire history of, of stream flow in a particular location, we calculated the one, two, five, 10, 25, and 50 year return period events for a given watershed. And then we asked the question is, if, if the observed data crosses that threshold, does the model also cross that threshold within a day? So if there's an extreme event as defined by a particular return period, a particular uh, magnitude of extreme event, 
if that really happens, does the model predict that that's going to happen within one day? And then we measure the precision and recall scores. That's the fraction of times that we predict that correctly. Uh, we, we, can, we measure that fraction for every location that we're predicting, all 11,000 locations, and we average that. So what's plotted over here is the average precision and recall score on different return period events. Again, one year, two year, five year, 10 year, 25 year, and 50 year. And these are our models that these are the uh, model where we've trained. The red is the model where we've trained on using data from all basins. That's our gauge basin model over 11,000 basins. And you can see that the return periods aren't listed here, but basically we get the best uh, uh, accuracy at predicting two year return period events. So that's one year, two year, uh, five year, 10 year, 25 year, and 50 year. And if we go all the way up to 50 year return period events, our accuracy, our, our precision and recall is much lower than predicting two year return period events. But in, in gauge basins, we're about 42, uh, between 40 and 45% accuracy in predicting these events. And that's a major jump over the current state of the art. So the purple here is the current state of the art. That's the European Union model. And they're at around 25 to 30% accuracy in predicting two-year return period events. So this is a this is a, a major step change in, in terms of the skill of predicting floods uh, globally, or at least predicting stream events in rivers globally. Okay. So that's the main message I want to give about the global model. Again, it, our the Google Flood Hub launched in um, November of last year. The data is freely available to anyone. You're welcome to go and, and get the data from the flood or get the predictions from the flood hub. Um, we're releasing larger data sets here in the next few months that can be used by the hydrological sciences community. And so for the last little bit of time that I'm going to speak, about 15 more minutes, I'd like to tell you about some technical things that we've done with machine learning, mixing uh, different sort of flavors of machine learning with our flood forecasting model to do some things that are let's say classically difficult in the hydrological sciences. So one of the things that we like to do is we like to use as much data as possible. So this means using as many types of weather predictions as possible. We're currently using rainfall data as inputs or drivers to our model that come from three types of sources. One are weather forecasting models. These are models that sort of solve the Navier-Stokes equations in the atmosphere and sort of predict these are where we get your weather forecasts if you're going to decide whether to wear, wear a raincoat or take an umbrella. The uh, second place we get weather uh, data is from satellites. So we use the uh, NASA IMERG product that uses the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission satellite data to produce a global estimate of rainfall every day. And that was only for the past. It's not a forecast. It's just past data. And the other place we get uh, input data for our model is the uh, our ground ground station, so rain gauges on the ground. And there's a, a NASA NOAA product uh, that sort of gathers as much of the uh, ground-based uh, rainfall data as possible and puts it on a grid and makes that available globally in real time. And we use that also to drive our model. But the key is that there are many different weather forecasting models that we can use. So most, uh, many, many governments around the world run a weather forecasting model as well as several private uh, companies. And we would like to be able to use all of this data because it's all informative. Weather forecasts have high uncertainty and having more different independent estimates of uh, when, when and where it's going to rain helps. And so uh, classically, the way that you would do this with a hydrology model is you would run a separate hydrology model for every weather forecast that you have. And then you would sort of average them together or combine them in some ensembling method somehow. With machine learning, we can just feed in all of the weather forecasts directly into the model. And we actually get a significant improvement on the skill. This is this is a CDF plot again showing the skill back in our US basins where we have 530, 531 basins in the US. And we're looking at the skill gap between the, the Sacramento model, which is again, the model that is underneath the NOAA flood prediction system in the United States. And the skill gap between that and the standard LSTM machine learning model that we use. And then the skill gap by using multiple sources of precipitation is, is another step change that's about the same size as the step change between classical hydrology modeling and machine learning hydrology modeling. So we get a lot of extra skill by using multiple precipitation estimates. And what's really cool is what the model's doing is it's learning how to combine these in sort of nonlinear and non-stationary ways. So it's not like it just listens to one 
the, maybe the most accurate precipitation estimate. It actually takes, here we have three different precipitation estimates from DayMet, Maurer, and the North American Land Data Simulation System, which is from NASA. And so these are just three different precipitation estimates. And the color that's plotted on these, uh, these graphs, these graphs represent the locations of the 531 watersheds where we had uh, training and test data. And the color of the dots are the precipitation product, blue, orange, or green, that the model decides to listen to most in a particular part of the hydrograph. So the whole hydrograph, that's like just overall, which precipitation product does the model like to listen to most? And it, remember, this is one model that's trained for all basins. So it's not a separate model for every location. It's one model for all locations, but it listens to different precipitation products differently in different locations and it also listens to different learns to listen to different precipitation products depending on whether the stream flow is increasing that's called the rising limb or decreasing called the falling limb and in particular it likes to look at different precipitation products today that's the top row versus oh, sorry today that's the second row versus yesterday which is the third row and two days ago and three days ago mm -hmm. it likes to listen to let's say the blue and the green precipitation products that's NLDS and Maurer uh, today and the orange or NLDS and Daymet that and the orange precipitation product yesterday and that's because there are certain biases in these products that are not spatially consistent and not temporally consistent and it learns these biases on a location specific basis one of the other things we can do with machine learning that's that's difficult in classical hydrology modeling is estimating uncertainty. So our models actually produce probability distributions. They don't just produce stream flow estimates. They actually produce distributions over stream flow. What you see on the flood hub is the 50th percentile or median of the probabilities that we predict. And the way we predict probabilities over stream flow is we have a layer in our neural network architecture that's a mixture density layer. It, instead of predicting values that are matched against the stream flow values that we're training to, we're predicting values that represent the parameters of a mixture probability distribution. And then the loss function that we use is the negative log likelihood of that mixture density fun of that mixture distribution. And so the output of our model are these, uh, this vector of parameters that define a probability distribution. And then we sample that probability distribution to get different quantiles. And the really interesting thing is that that over a, a, a QQ plot over the full range of stream flow in our training, our test data set, the mixture density functions that the model learns to produce again in the test period is almost perfectly calibrated. So we have almost perfect calibration. We're using this blue line here. These are several different types of uh, probabilistic treatments, uh, M MCD, Monte Carlo dropout, CMOL is a countable mixture of asymmetric Laplacians. That's a type of mixture density function, uh, mixture distribution, GMM is a Gaussian mixture model, and UMOL is an uncountable mixture of asymmetric Laplacians. And so we use these, these sort of tested these four different ways of quantifying uncertainty. And again, these are layers in our deep learning model that, that produce probabilities instead of deterministic estimates. And we found that one of them is, is very good at quantifying the uncertainty in uh, in, in, in stream flow estimates, you, what you want, this is a QQ plot, meaning the quantile of, of stream flow from zero to one is on the x-axis and the quantile of predicted stream flow for, uh, uh, is on uh, zero to one. And so you want a perfect statistical model should lie al exactly along the one-to-one -one line. And we do in fact have a model that lies very close to the one-to-one -one line. So we're, we're, we're very good at predicting uncertainty distributions around our stream flow estimates. We can also do data simulation. This may be a little more technical than we want to get into here, but data simulation is a way to bring real-time data into the model to sort of correct the model in real time. So if, if you have a source of data that is updating in real time, let's say there's a well, some government that's very reliable at sending us stream flow data in real time, and so we get data maybe with a lag of one day or something like that, then what we want to do is we want to ingest this into our model in real time so that the model has the most up-to-date information possible. The challenge is that we also want to make predictions in places that don't have stream flow data. So we can't just take the most recent stream flow data and add it as an input to the model because then we would need that input anywhere. So we can do data simulation and data simulation is a way where you compare the output of the model with some observation and then you take the difference 
and you back propagate that difference onto the internal states of the model. This is used regularly in weather forecasting, for example, it's used regularly in hydrology. And the really cool thing is you can do this with a machine learning model without formal Bayesian methods because the machine learning models have uh, gradients, deriv uh, derivatives that exist everywhere. This is how they're trained with backpropagation. You can just backpropagate the differences in, in real time during inference. So when the model is actually making a prediction rather than when it's being trained, you can take those differences and you can backpropagate it into the model and you can sort of, in a way, retrain the model as it's making predictions in real time. This is a, there's sort of a formal uh, similarity between classical data simulation that's used, for example, by weather forecasting models, and th this sort of ability to apply back propagation in a neural network during uh, inference. And so we get we get data simulation very very cheaply without having to run ensembles and without having to actually set up a formal data simulation system like an ensemble Kalman filter system or something like that. But it turns out that even that, so we, data simulation is much easier in machine learning models than it is in, in classical models. But beyond that, we don't actually need um, we, we don't actually need data simulation because it turns out you can just put real time data into the as inputs into the model. Um, even in places where you don't have it, you would just put in some imputed value, and then you can send the model some flag telling it as as a separate input channel telling it, okay, this is an imputed value, and actually that gives uh, that gives skill that is uh, equal or even slightly better than doing uh, data simulation. So feeding in real time to the data to the model is a very hard problem in hydrology. It takes a lot of computational expense and a lot of uh, computational infrastructure and a lot of fine uh, tuning. And it's a much easier problem with machine learning. Okay, the last thing that I'd say is that um, these models are very cheap to run. So and they're very cheap to run and to calibrate. So in the in the US examples that I've been showing for most of this slide deck, we train our models on the order of, of hours. So the blue bar here is sort of how long wall time in hours on a log scale, that's the Y axis. We train our models on a single uh, sort of now very, quite old GPU, V100 GPU. We train in uh, the one model to predict everywhere in the United States with this uh, V100 GPU and it takes us uh, somewhere less than two hours, or I mean, sorry, somewhere less than 10 hours, somewhere between one and 10 hours. And then uh, calibrating a classical hydrology model, even a very simple one like the Sacramento model that's used again by the NOAA Flood Forecasting Agency, calibrating that takes somewhere for the same number of locations for the same data in the same time period now on 40 a uh, 40 core processor takes somewhere on the order of months. So we're several orders of magnitude difference between months and hours cheaper to train and run the models. And this helps us scale up globally. So what, what does the future look like? Um, the big problem, or, or I don't wanna say problem because I'm not sure that we know for sure what that problem looks like, but the big uncertainty with machine learning in my opinion is scaling to longer term predictions. So short term predictions like flood forecasts are um, are, they're relatively easy. You don't have to deal with non-stationarity in the way that you do with sort of climate scale problems or uh, S2S uh, sub-seasonal to seasonal scale problems. Um, this is sort of a, a perfect use case, in, in my opinion, of machine learning doing these short-term forecasts that have some sort of impact. But uh, so I think it's an open question how, how uh, if we were having this conversation 10 years from now, what the landscape of, of machine learning in this in the water sector would, would look like. And I think there's sort of a, a couple things that are emerging. I'll talk about just one or two of them really quickly. Uh, one is um, these hierarchical graph models. So when we build climate models, you know, probably most people in the audience are at least generally familiar with how a climate model is built. But there are these different components like an atmosphere component, a land component, an ocean component, maybe a sea ice component, maybe a vegetation component. There's these different components that are contributed usually by different modeling teams to a large earth systems model that's then trained in some sense and used to make climate scale predictions. And each of these different components is actually a graph uh, of relationships between different variables. So the land component of a climate model might include soil moisture and snow and evapotranspiration and some carbon fluxes like net ecosystem exchange. And this is sort of how the models are, are, are uh, constructed, or at least it's one way to think about how models are constructed. And the thing that I would point out here is that th this is an architecture that looks 
very similar to how large machine learning models are built. So we can easily land machine learning components onto any types of any components of these large models that we want. And so this is kind of the direction that we're taking now to expand on the flood forecasting project to do to build larger earth systems models. We're kind of uh, building these sort of conceptual hierarchical graph models where we can land physics or we can land um, machine learning in sort of interchangeable components. And I don't want to show any results for that because those are sort of new projects, but this is a project that we're currently working on. And to sort of leave, uh, leave the talk that on a slightly more philosophical note, I'll just give my overview of what I see happening in um, earth system science with uh, in terms of integrating AI. And I think this, this let's call it a timeline, although it doesn't have any units, this sort of timeline read from left to right captures sort of my intuition about what's happening. Uh, for years, we had sort of physics models that were built and the sort of quintessential example of that are the climate models that participate in the, I, uh, in, in the climate model in a comparison project that informs the IPCC reports. Um, more recently, we've had a lot of efforts, uh, many, many efforts, both in Europe and the United States, and of course, all over the world, trying to understand how AI can help support these, these models. So these are things like uh, using machine learning to parameterize models, using machine learning to post-process outputs. Um, there have been some efforts, in the, especially in the last couple years, to, to integrate machine learning components into these giant physical physics models, so a, a great example of that is uh, replacing high uncertainty components like uh, cloud resolving physics in uh, atmospheric fluid dynamics models. So we can integrate some AI components into the physics that we're, that we're building. Um, there is this new uh, family of, of predictive models that have, have emerged, especially in the last six months to one year, where these are um, graph models. These are graph conceptual models like what I showed last time and some of these models are winning uh, weather bench uh, weather bench competitions so some of the best in terms of metrics uh, the best uh, weather forecasting models in the world are using these sort of conceptual graph model structures and this is a this is an area of machine learning that's been around a long time and has been used in earth science for a long time but is really starting to be um, at the, at the forefront of what we're doing and, and sort of dominating conversations but there is a new thing that's happening um, these uh, people are starting to build, there's been one paper published that I know about from Microsoft starting to build uh, uh, foundational, geo-foundational models where we're taking some of the lessons learned from semi-supervised models that are like the language models that are underneath ChatGPT and applying those to uh, geo geoscience problems, building giant geoscience models out of these. And I think um, what the, the message that I want to give here is that this timeline is accelerating. So we spent decades building physics models. We spent years, maybe half a decade, doing really serious work on AI supported support structures around physics models. We spent about a year, maybe, I, of course, people have been doing this for a long time, but there was a lot of conversation about ML-based parameterizations for a year, maybe arguably uh, five years. And then these conceptual graph models have started to really be the center of, of what's happening, especially in, in weather forecasting within the last six months. And we're already starting to see people moving beyond that and build uh, true uh, semi-supervised or unsupervised AI models for geoscience problems. And the point that I'm trying to make here is that the landscape is moving very, very fast. Um, if you're working on a project that was funded like I am, that was funded a year and a half ago, you're probably part of a conversation that is um, not uh, not at the forefront. And so uh, we're going to see a lot of these uh, concepts, I think, in the next in the next half decade, we're going to see a lot of these mature and we're going to have a much better understanding of what works and what doesn't in this space. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks so much for this great talk. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of questions and doubts and curiosities in the chat. So let's uh, let's start the fire. <laughs> and uh, I think that there there are like a bunch of already like technical, more technical questions uh, for different aspects of your of your presentation. Um, for example, there is like uh, a talk uh, 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 a question by Diego Perazzolo. Who is asking about your 
the code, right, and the availability of the code. You actually mm -hmm. said that it is available online. He, he is very interested in using it and, and, and asking for the GitHub repo or things like that. Maybe this information can be shared afterwards in the in the. Sure. If, if you don't mind, I'll just share. I'll say where the GitHub repo is right now. Uh, so the just to be clear, we have a internal version of the code that we use at Google that we don't share publicly. And the reason for that is not because we're trying to hide anything or keep anything secret. There's uh, nothing that we do that we're not saying publicly. But the reason is because our infrastructure, computational infrastructure here looks very different than most HPC environments. So you couldn't take our code and run it somewhere else. We have a research version of our code that does almost everything that our internal code does. We keep it up to date as much as possible and it's really up to date at this point and it's on neuralhydrology.github.io so if you want to use this code or kind of see what it what we're doing you can go to neuralhydrology.github.io and you can look at sort of the research version of the code this code was produced by a uh, a couple of grad students that google funded over the last few years to do some of the preliminary research and also to make sure that this code was available fantastic um yeah. There, there's also another another technical question more related to to the to the data that you're actually using. Notion uh, um, uh, Hadidian, uh, he's actually asking, do you work just on basin data or also on damage grade assessment in the post phase of a flood? Okay, I, I'm so sorry, I missed the second half of the question. Or on or also on damage grade assessment in the post phase of a flood. No, right now we're only doing predictive stuff. Uh, uh, stuff. We actually have a team at, it uh, sort of a team that we, a uh, sister team here at Google that does do post disaster damage assessment, but we don't feed any of that back into our flood forecasting model. Mm -hmm. um, Martin Pierre, uh, he's he's asking about what what is the watershed minimal size that you are considering for flood warning each year. Yes, so I just looked that up. I think the smallest size watershed that we have in our training data set is 4.1 square kilometer, and the largest is several hundred thousand square kilometers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, there is a correlation. We're, we're obviously better on large watersheds than small, but it still, we had, and we did test sort of training different models for large and small, and we still get the best results training one model on everything. Yeah, actually, this is pretty related to what uh, Marcus Maas is, is, is putting here in the chat. He says, is this, this flood forecast related only to, to big rivers or also small streams? Or, or there is like a, a fundamental law that you're basically following to, to get the data from or, or considering? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So like all hydrology models, we're much better in large humid basins than we are in small and arid basins. And that's one of the reasons why we don't launch our, our models publicly everywhere. We don't want to give flood predictions that we think are not not useful or even are potentially damaging. So, and again, the two major factors, the, the biggest factor in terms of where we are good and where we're not is the aridity index. So we're much better in humid basins, much worse in flashier arid basins, but we all are also better in uh, large basins and small basins. However, again, we found that using all of that data, no matter what kind of basin it comes from, from our it, it, during training is better than actually trying to take some of the basins out during training. And then we don't have a rule for where we launch. We actually look at every hydrograph and we, we have a couple of criteria that we use to decide where to launch, but they're all database. They're not based on this type of catchment or that type of catchment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I saw that in one of your slides, you were doing these exercises for, you know, for ensuring kind of a robustness of the method uh, with different strategies for cross-validation, either climate zones or, um, you know, standard cross-validation like uh, uh, default or things like that. So can you say something about that? Because it, it, this is actually a, an interesting, an interesting problem these days uh, with so many specialization exercises out there, and people are actually questioning uh, these days about the, you know, the representativity of the map that you that we are generating in many, in many areas, and it is not really clear. There is like a, an ongoing discussion about the, the, the ways of of cross validated methods and, and, and models. Uh, I don't know, can you say something, uh, some words about uh, what is your experience and what are the final model 
uh, that you're or the final strategy for cross validation that you're using? Yeah, so that's a really really good question, and we we have um, done some work on fancier cross validation studies based on embedding based on clustering in embedding layers and things like that. However, we found that just generally and this is sort of a subjective comment more than an evidence-based comment, but we found generally that when we speak to hydrologists in particular and people that are using used to using hydrology data, the, the cross-validation studies that sort of make the most impact are ones that are based on hydrological intuition. And at a global scale, it's uh, you can take that to any level you want. We could leave out a certain country, we could leave out a certain type of county or region. Um, so what I presented here are just sort of the large scale cross validation studies that we've done that are backed that are that were kind of chosen based on hydrological intuition. Yeah, I, I will say that no, the, the, the results we get do depend like the cross validation study does change the results, obviously, but again, I want to stress that we have not found any way to split up the training data set that makes it better to train on only part of the data than all of the data. So that's a different question than how well you're doing on different splits, but I, I will say no matter how we split it, that's what we've discovered so far. Yeah, so far. I think that's, that's a, a hard problem also because of the different different levels or different quality levels that you may have, right? And different different basins and in different regions, probably that that, that differs quite a, quite a bit and yes. that compromises like, you know, an, an harmonized strategy for, for splitting. It's worth mentioning that we spend a very large amount of time manually looking at data and throwing out the basins based on purely on on human assessment. This mm -hmm. is a really critical part of the of the process. Yeah. Yes, um, I I have a, a bunch of questions here in the chat as well uh, by one, but well there are a couple of, of uh, more technical questions related to the, the LSTM uh, encoder decoder that you're using. Uh, question by Nishai Kaki. He says that well, uh, great talk, and he's uh, he's concerned about what what about the hydro hydraulic model in the LSTM encoder decoder. Uh, what about this model? Is is it numerical or is it also AI based or what, what ah, is it? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. We've we've looked at that quite extensively. We don't use a hydraulic model. It's a great okay. question and. Uh, it seems like we should be using a hydraulic model. So uh, we don't, and the reason we don't is because we get the best results not using a hydraulic model. We've tested um, using a unit hydrograph type hydraulic model like the NOAA uses in their, in, in their operational system. And we've also tested using graph convolution models. So it, taking the LSTM as sort of a node in a graph and then having a graph convolution representing the, the uh, stream hydrography. And we, we get the best results just not doing that. So the best quality predictions we can get are just training the LSTM at every place that we want to make a, a prediction, no matter the size of the basin, and dealing with sub-basin, uh, uh, larger basin, you know, stream order uh, architectures, uh, just by doing different separate models for each level of the, of the stream, even if it's in the same stream. And that's, a, that's something we spend a lot of time on and uh, we kind of understand why it works like that, but we don't have a routing model. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. No, uh, especially because there there have been like uh, quite a quite a few works uh, out there on the on the combination of physics based models and and machine learning. Yes. Um. Um. Apparently, well, also Frederick, I think that he he talked about that two weeks yep. ago, and um, I guess that you're you're. You have been having better experience with just data-driven models than than trying to force some kind of uh, you know ad hoc or or uh, or mechanistic models out there. No? Yes, so far, and we've really looked. At, we've really spent a lot of time with this too. So far, we have we have not found a way to bring physics into the model that doesn't degrade the quality of our predictions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There, there is another, another, um, another, on another issue, right? On this, on this uh, ensemble um, um, methodology that you proposed here, um, there is uh, another question by the same, by the same attendee. It says, uh, "Wow, that's uh, that's uh, really an interesting point. Uh, do you see any possibility of correcting the biases and improving these satellite products for hydrological prediction using the the, the model that you just learned, right?" Because 
you learn a model that uh, or an ensemble, maybe that 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 help, that helps in correcting biases of the uh, satellite yeah. product that we use. Yeah. So I, I don't want to claim that we're we we've not made any real effort to correct the biases in the satellite data. Mm -hmm. That being said, we have seen biases in the satellite data. In fact, one of those three products has a very strong bias in just in the eastern United States that's not in the western United States. And we can see that very clearly. And we can see that the deep learning models learn to uh, adjust for this bias in terms of how it relates to stream flow. So we can train a model that with this bias data set, and so we can calibrate sort of a physics-based model, and we see that the stream flow is biased due to the bias in this precipitation data set. We can't calibrate away all of that bias in the classical model, but we can train away most, almost all of that bias or at least most of it using a deep learning model. And uh, that's really interesting. And so the question is whether you can then go back and use that to adjust the precipitation data. And so we actually have done that and uh, we have no idea if we've done it well or poorly because we spent like very little time on it. But the way that we approached that was back propagating the differences between the predicted and simulated stream flow, back propagating that instead of onto the weights and biases of the neural network, back propagating it onto the input data. And so we have adjusted the input data. And I definitely do not want to make the claim that this improves the input data, but it, there are at least mechanisms to move that information from the model outputs onto the model inputs if someone wanted to spend the time to do it. Yeah. So there, a few minutes ago, we were talking about the data quality and the, you know, and this different strategies for, for training models um, and different splits and strategies and everything. And, and, and now we have a, a related question, but instead of making the, the focus on the, well, putting the focus on the, on the, on the splitting, uh, John, uh, Juan and Manuel Johnson, he's, he's ask, asking about the, the metrics that are used for evaluating the, 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 the models, right? For the training and evaluation. So he says that I remember many papers from you uh, in the information theoret theoretic perspective, which I thought were very interesting. Uh, any thoughts about how to feasibly integrate those ideas into the framework? So more in yeah. the characterization of the data probably and the characterization of the training that mentioned so. Yeah, so I think there's two questions in there. One is whether you can design a better loss function, maybe an information theoretic loss function. And the other is what types of metrics are sufficient to evaluate a model? I think those are two separate questions. And I wanna answer the second, I think he actually asked the first is what I heard, but I wanna answer the second one. Sorry about that. The, because we just have a paper on this that's in review and available on Earth Archive called In Defense of Metrics. And the question that we asked in that paper is we, we set up a web server where it would show two model predictions and the observed data to a user and the user would click on one button or the other depending on whether they liked model A or model B better. And we got, we asked professional hydrologists to spend some time on this website and we got several many, many thousands of, of, of response or at least uh, of interactions with the website from several hundred uh, professional hydrologists. And we took all of that data and we trained another machine learning model to sort of to, and we calculated all the all, all a suite of standard hydrology metrics from those hydrographs. Then we trained the machine learning model to take the uh, quantitative metrics that we calculated and predict what the user would say about the about the comparison between two models. And we found that the machine learning model that predicts a use a, a human's preference between two models is actually more accurate than humans. So it was more accurate in predicting the mean preference of a human between any two, any pair of models, then the spread between the humans was for predicting that same thing. So what I wanna say here is I think that it's very hard to choose metrics to evaluate models. No metric is perfect, but I do wanna say that I think that if you look at a very large suite of metrics, that it, it contains most of the information that a human would want to have about, uh, about whether a model is good or not, or at least the comparison between two models. I, th I think that was a fascinating study that was done by a PhD student at, at Johannes Kepler University recently. So um, about the first one, are there better loss functions? The answer is absolutely yes, and please tell us what they are. We would love for you to tell us someone to come up with a better um, loss function. Right now, we're just using the log likelihoods because we like to have these mixture density models, but 
uh, we really want to predict floods and nothing in our loss function is emphasizing high flows or extreme events or anything like that. So this is an open area of research for us. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, um, there is another related question by Jacobo Ferrario. Uh, he says that I understand that the prediction is the main goal here, but are you trying to extract some useful knowledge about the processes on the, on the going there uh, from the deep learning model? I think that, that, that question more is more in the, in, you know, in the way of, or uh, in the sense of uh, interpretability or explainability, or if you can get something out of the other, of, of the big black box model that you're using. No, we are not, and we're not interested in that. You are not interested at all? No. <laughs> and, and a particular reason for that, I mean, if, if yeah. the model predicts well, in principle, you should have learned anything, right? Um, we've, we've, used to spend time on that because we got that question from scientists and we just found it to be mostly not not a useful avenue of research yeah N nothing nothing that came out of that um helped us in any tangible way yeah that's just my personal opinion we we i think it's a great thing to do we just personally our team has just decided not to invest in that for, for mm -hmm. ourselves yeah okay got it um uh, jacob william uh, he's He's just asking, considering the fast model training time, because we have seen these this bars, it's really amazing, has uh, been tried? Uh, sometimes a model Sarah sharply drops after staying stable for a long time. So, um, so, sorry, I didn't quite understand the question one more time. So, so um, I think that he's asking about the the how the error changes, I think, uh, according to to your your training time. I mean, but I, I don't really get it either. So okay. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe he can clarify afterwards in the in the in our network. Uh, there, there is a, another interesting question here by Andrea Ficci. He says mm -hmm. that Rick uh, Ray, you have presented the performance of stream flow predictions of, of your models. What about flood inundation extent? Uh, any, any yeah. Any insight on that? Uh, what about okay. that? And he said, he says, uh, uh, he says, uh, my understanding is that you have trained a machine learning model for flood extent two. Yes. Yes. Can you tell us a bit more data use for training and performance, etc.? Okay. So yes, we have an inundation model, and you notice it was completely absent from my talk because I'm not on the inundation team. Um, I can tell you a little bit about it. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I would be happy to talk about it offline. Um, I will say two things. One is mostly what we're using as training data is satellite data. And the satellite data is a major limitation because it's sparse um, and it's sparse in a couple ways. Optical is sparse in a different way than SAR, the synthetic capture radar. And it's a hard problem to bring all that data together. And so we, we launch inundation models some places, but we don't launch them in everywhere that we launch uh, streamflow models. So there are places where we're streamflow only and places where we're streamflow and inundation. And there are also places where we use the inundation model to validate the streamflow model against, because SAR imagery is another uh, source of ground truth data. I think the my personal opinion here, and I don't wanna speak now for anyone except myself because I'm not, uh, I don't personally work on inundation modeling, but I think that inundation modeling is primed for a major breakthrough. So I think that if I look out on the landscape of all the inundation modeling that people are doing right now, which is extremely exciting work from all over the place, um, uh, for many, many different organizations around the world are doing really exciting work, I still have yet to see a model that takes all of the information that's available about this problem and puts it into one bucket. And what I mean by that is I can imagine a time series model that acts on optical imagery, DEMs, um, geophysical attributes, streamflow data, and SAR data, and somehow synthesizes all of that into some sort of uh, prediction. And I have yet to see a model that does this. And so I think that, you know, if I were advising, for example, a PhD student to pick a project, I think this is a this is an area of research that's sort of primed for a major breakthrough. And I would love to see it happen. And then for whoever does it to give it to us at Google. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that there, there are no more questions there in the chat, but I have a, a, a well, a bunch, but not many, but more general ones rather than technical. I, I was uh, intrigued by, by, I mean, to, to, to get your opinion or, or your insight on the future, right? Uh, are, you, are you working on, let's say, more um, 
I mean, this is a very exciting, exciting um, um, area of research and development. Uh, it has also like a, a lot of, you know, models that you do, they're, they're put in practice in, into practice and they have like a lot of uh, societal and economical uh, impacts, right? In the end and implications, no? So I was curious about what is really the, the 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 future of research and and what are your investments more on either on better models let's say more more efficient models or acute accurate models or more into let's say into to characterizing the, the predictions let's say because in the end at, at the end of the chain you will have to provide a decision or a recommendation uh, for policymakers or for you know the players or the actors there. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's also the, the communication facet of, of the whole of the whole problem that also plays a role here. So yeah. I don't I don't know what what is your I mean in, in probably I mean your your basic interest is to to get better models that's for sure. But I don't know how 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 much emphasis are you putting in the communication aspect of the whole problem, or maybe if you're uh, thinking of uh, including the the citizen in the loop, right? And like in this field of citizen science, that it is uh, quite quite active these days as well. So I don't know what what are your takes on this. I mean, well, it is as I told you a more general question, but I just wanted to to learn about you. Cool. Yeah. So first of all, we're working very actively on on end user engagement. And in fact, I think that's if I had to, if I had to give a personal opinion, I think that's the most important part of the project, uh, not only from here on out, but also in the past. I think the modeling is easy compared to the human engagement part of the problem. And we are very interested in uh, c developing citizen science programs. And we're starting a little bit of that here at Google, but probably if if um, to be honest with you, we're probably on my, I, I think we're, we may be under investing in that compared to the potential that it could provide, uh, both in inundation uh, data and maybe even stream flow data, which is a little less close to the personal experience. So, uh, but the communication and the dissemination of forecasts and the ability to reach people is the hardest problem to solve. It's much harder to solve than the modeling problem. And also, I think that's one of the reasons why I think it's exciting that this work is happening in Google. So. Uh, private company is not really the traditional place to do this kind of work, but Google has one thing that is really valuable in this space, and that's the ability to reach a lot of people. And that's really what we're trying to capitalize on. And the modeling effort is just there to support this ability to reach people. Um, we, we have ex talked about and explored to some extent um, actually releasing forecasts that aren't our own. So sometimes then we have done this to some extent in a couple of countries where a government will give us forecasts and then we'll use that or we'll use it in conjunction with our models and disseminate that forecast because our real strength is actually not, you know, for, for whatever it's worth, you know, we can, we're pretty good at AI modeling, but that's not our real strength in this area. Our real strength is how to reach people. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Thanks uh, very much. Um, um, I think that uh, Oscar has like a personal interest and he says that uh, any thoughts on the recent floods in Mozambique? Uh, did your model uh, yes. was put into practice have any predictive inputs into into the results of the cyclone or anything yeah. like that? Yeah, so we followed the Mozambique floods very carefully, very closely. And one of the reasons for that is because we were working with this uh, NGO, uh, Give Directly, who is planning on giving relief uh, in the form of cash to, to individuals on the ground based on the forecast that we made. So they sent um, payments of, I believe, I believe it was $200 a person to people in villages where we forecasted there would be floods. And then some villages they didn't and they sent payments afterward and they're collect currently collecting data on which way works best prior or post uh, event. And so we've been following those closely. And one of the really interesting things we noticed in the forecast is that we go seven days out into the future and we notice that the forecast changes by half an order of magnitude, half, let's say 50% at least on, um, but from day to day. And this is totally dependent on the forecast that we get about the hurricane trajectory or the amount of energy, you know, the, the hurricane forecast, the weather forecast. And these weather forecasts can cause um, very, very drastic changes in the flood forecasts. And so the best that we can do is sort of make sure that we're staying on top of the new weather forecast, which we do in an automated way. Of course, we ingest them automatically. And then we can watch the sort of the forecast change from 
uh, at the beginning of these, of when we were predicting major floods in Mozambique, we were seeing floods on the order, I don't remember the numbers, but twice as high as they ended up being. And then uh, uh, that was a, our initial seven day forecast. And by the time they got down to four day forecast, it was like a quarter of what we've been predicting. And then by the time that the floods actually happened, it was something in between the two. And just watching this fluctuation as we saw the event come closer just gave us a sense of how um, how high the uncertainty is in these things, but but also that it's possible to work around that uncertainty and to see that when the model really is responding to likely events and giving you giving you reasonable probabilities about what's going to happen. And in the end, we were able to um, predict these floods in a useful way. I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's great. Yeah, um, another. Possibly the final question by Jin Deng. Uh, he says, thanks, Gray. I have a question regarding the, the rainfall forecast products. The quality of the rainfall input is quite important. Uh, how do you account for the for this outside of the basins where you have access to local gauge uh, uh, rainfall data? Using global forecast products may, may likely decrease the model performance. Yeah. That's absolutely true. It is absolutely true with 100% certainty um, that using global forecast products is less accurate than using regional forecast products, especially in certain areas of the world that have good forecasts. Now, it, it's also true that not all areas of the world have good forecasts and the places that we care most about actually tend to have lower quality forecasts than the places where we have lots of training data. And this, this, this is a serious problem. And so, I think the 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 best thing that we can do is to sort of be aware that this is a major source of uncertainty and to to track it. So to watch to watch what the weather forecasts are doing and make sure that the models are responding and understand that we're um, heavily reliant on this highly uncertain data product. Mm -hmm. I, I will say one thing about that, and that's here's a, here's a research project. If anybody wants it, it's very strange to me that we use rainfall to drive flood forecasts because rainfall is one of the lowest accuracy variables from a, from a weather model. So rainfall is one of these things that relies on the subgrade cloud formation in a global circulation model, which is one of the highest uncertainty portions of the global circulation model. And I don't think it's necessarily the case that we have to, for, for a machine learning model that we have to actually feed it with rainfall. We could instead feed it with other atmospheric variables that come directly from the dynamical core of a weather model. And I think that there's at least potential for, for another sort of step change in accuracy and flood forecasting for someone to try to do a, build a, an ML or AI based flood forecasting model that, that skips the need for rainfall and goes directly from uh, the higher quality atmospheric variables like pr pressure fields, for example, and humidity fields and wind fields onto global uh, images of floods. And so there's a PhD student out there that's looking for to make their mark in this area. I think, I think there's real potential. Thanks. Uh, and I think that this is the, the final question by Emil uh, Kreshek. Uh, he said, um, uh, hi, great product. Uh, what is your strategy for engaging various actors of emergy, emergency and disaster management so they can, let's say, include it in, into their workflow? Yeah. So we have a team here that's d dedicated to that, actually several teams that interface with NGOs and governments and um, and, and um, global agencies like the WMO and the, and, and the European Union. Um, and so we put a lot of time into this and we listen to feedback about what people want and how they want the model to be, the data to be accessible and what they want it to say and what, what matters. Um, and that depends on organization to organization. So uh, the, first of all, I'm, I'm a modeler, not, not an outreach person, but this is, um, again, I think this is really the, interesting thing that's happening sort of much more interesting than the AI developments if you want my personal opinion is just the ability to produce forecasts and then to have them available to users and kind of get feedback from from what they're saying so I, I don't want to give any specific examples because I, I don't want to um, say, say anything about a, a partner that may not be warned that we're talking about them but the um, we do work closely with partners to understand their needs and understand what moves the needle for them and this is a a strength, I think, of what Google does. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. I think that uh, well, we had like a great discussion uh, around a very timely, very important topic in the 
Uh, thanks so much, Gray, for presenting and answering all these questions. It was really fantastic to, to have you here. Uh, now it's time for closing the session. Um, thanks again for the talk and the discussions and, uh, and to all the attendees. Thanks for, for being with us uh, too. And, and remember that you, you can still continue the conversations in the NAR network area. Uh, if you're registered, of course, and that is uh, good. I think that that's a good opportunity to follow up with any questions that you that you may not answer or curiosities or you know exchanging um, you know pointers to other auxiliary information. Well, our next talk in our seminar series on our, on AI for Earth and Sustainability Science will be on March 29th uh, with two exciting well and, and kind of uh, provocative titles. Uh, one is the title "Climate Modeling with AI: Hype or Reality," and the second one is in "Deep Learning and the Dynamics of Physical Processes." They will be given by Laura Sana and Patrick Gallinari. And this time will be Marcus Reistein, uh, who will be the moderator. Well, and actually, uh, just a final, a final note, if you want more on the role of AI for the Earth and climate, just sign up in, your, in our sister seminar series, AI and Climate Science, that is convened by Duncan Watson and Philip Steer. And, and, and the next talk, I think it is, it has to do with climate forecasts. Uh, next uh, to, uh, next Wednesday, March 22nd. Well, thanks everyone and have a good day. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions. Like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good. AI is a powerful tool. summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values.